Hey! So, I'm Raven, your acid bath princess of the darkness. And I'm Tara. Has there ever been a teenage subculture as reviled and misunderstood as the humble emo? For a time, it was a catch-all term of derision, reserved for anyone who wore black, listened to My Chemical Romance, and exhibited some worrying self-roping tendencies. But all that moping and the music that inspired it actually has a complex history. And to understand it fully, we have to go back to the beginning. While no one knows the name of Emo's Patient Zero, they were likely a member of the Washington hardcore punk scene in the 1980s. Bands like Minor, Threat, Fugazi, and State of Alert were producing three-chord anger screeds for small, devoted audiences. And like their emo descendants, these punks wore black, cut their hair with industrial lawn equipment, and took themselves very seriously. But these punks were also deeply political, even expressly anarchist, like these two specimens who decry the woes of capitalism while hanging out in a mall, with none other than a somehow still very old Bernie Sanders. What does your address mean? What does it say, or does it mean anything, or what? Um, it's just basically saying, to heck with society. Yeah, to heck with capitalism. Ronald Reagan can go fudge himself in his bunghole. By 1985, the DC punk scene was in need of a makeover, as it had caught a well-earned reputation for being moronically violent, mostly owing to the fact that their concerts looked like a cross between a Black Friday stampede and an Indian train carriage at rush hour. <laughs> Some people call it slamming, and some people call it pogoing, and some call it the skang. But uh, I just call it dancing, because that's normally what you're doing. I just call this more or less a slam. It's just keep going in a circle, with, 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 keep moving your arms and stuff. During what was known as Revolution Summer, bands like Rites of Spring and Embrace offered a new direction for the genre. These artists wrote more introspective lyrics and rejected the scene's political posturing for a whinier, more emotional perspective. Thrasher magazine called this style emo core, but even then it was meant as a disparaging term. Emo core must be the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Well, emotional hardcore, as if hardcore wasn't emotional to begin with. This would set a precedent that would follow the emo plague all the way into its heyday, with bands constantly uncomfortable with being labelled as sad sacks screaming about their feelings. Despite this, the post-hardcore emo virus spread from coast to coast over the next decade, giving birth to a brood of ear-assaulting sub-sub-genres. There were the radio-friendly incel jams of nerd rock, there was screamo music, the official soundtrack to school shootings everywhere, and of course, there was pop punk, emo's fun-loving cousin, whose close association with the genre would be its ultimate undoing. But it was bands like Sunny Day Real Estate and Jawbreaker that charted the course to what emo would become, producing punk-adjacent hits with pleasing guitar melodies and lyrics dripping with personal drama. <laughs> It wasn't really until 2001 where the iconic image of emohood solidified like bacon grease on the oven floor of popular culture. Jimmy Eat World released The Middle on their self-financed album American Bleed, a huge mainstream hit that was as irritating as it was billboard friendly. Suddenly record executives realised that emos were more than just basement dwelling dweebs and were in fact a lucrative growth market. <laughs> As broadband internet connections became more widespread, the irritating screech of a dial-up connection was replaced by the equally grating sound of teenagers expressing themselves. Emo was arguably the first subculture to truly spread through the internet. Websites like LiveJournal and MySpace acted as the sweaty public toilet door handles, accelerating Emo's bubonic burst into mainstream culture. Emo fans would plaster their profile with lyrics from their favourite bands, create fan sites, and communicate with other people who liked to play noughts and crosses on their forearms. But most of all, these online spaces were responsible for disseminating what became known as the iconic emo look. The emo look centred on a few necessities and tons of optional extras. But if one is to truly understand the emo, one must become the emo. Look, I'll admit I went too far on this one, but I believe in committing to a bit. And that's what emo's about, you know? Committing to looking like a fucking idiot. Eye makeup was a must, slavered above and below the eye, to really bring out the skull that lives inside all of our face meat. Black jeans that looked like they were painted on were also a must, and could be accessorised with a studded belt, which could be worn anywhere on the body provided it was at a 45 degree angle. Black lipstick was optional, but it was encouraged. 
a fashion choice which only ever reminds me of this line from The Sopranos. Look like a Puerto Rican whore. Make me sick. So? Band t-shirts were also very important, but anything black would suffice. There are also these separate arm sleeve things which make it look like your arms are wearing lingerie. Another optional extra was turning your lower lip into a playground for bacteria, as well as a target for any school bully and or passing crow. Of course, the most important part of the emo armour is dyed black hair, straightened to obscure teenage acne and to make sure you catch yourself in the mirror as little as possible. The emos paved the way for many norms of social media. They pioneered the full body selfie and they were applying filters and photoshop to their photos when Instagram was just a vapid dream in the head of whoever was inventing it. And emo culture was also discussing mental health and LGBT rights long before it dominated public discourse and admittedly it was a bit fucked up at times. But today, the internet only approaches these topics in a mature, open-minded manner, and we have these fringe, fondling frontiersmen to thank for it. It doesn't feel hot or uncomfortable yet. In fact, it doesn't yeah. really feel, like, much. Well, that's good, because it's not meant to touch your scalp, so... Um... It's not meant to touch your scalp. No. Good to know. By 2004, record labels had fully weaponized the emo virus. In a space of two years, it would go from being a public health concern to a full-blown pandemic. There were the wildly successful wine pop stylings of Fall Out Boy, a band with five members but only four chins. And there were the theatre school rejects known as Panic at the Disco, an act famous for their obnoxiously long song titles and that one bit in their one song where a guy says a naughty no-no word. What a shame the poor groom's bride is a whore. I Sensing the dark winds blowing towards the Hot Topic entrance, other acts pivoted to the emo aesthetic as well. Blink-182 stopped producing music specifically to be played on American Pie soundtracks, and attempted to get all sensitive with the release of I Miss You, a song dedicated to the relatable woes of missing your ex-girlfriend and spiders eating your insides. Spiders catching things and eating their insides. Green Day also intentionally infected themselves with the emo virus embracing the aesthetic and the depressing lyrics with their six times platinum album, American Idiot. But Emo's commercial peak came on the 12th of September, 2006, in the form of a literal parade. My Chemical Romance's ode to a cancer death fever dream somehow became an enormous mainstream hit. For months following its release, it was inescapable. It was playing on the radio, on music video channels, on LimeWire, and from the back of the school bus, playing on the tinny speakers of someone's Motorola Razor. And if that one sounds too specific, that's because I was the one playing it. Hello, Moto. It is the third law of culture that any action is always met with an equal and opposite backlash. And Emo's front lash was so seismic that its critics arrived armed with all the unholy powers of the mainstream media. Now, emo is a term you may or may not have come across. It's short for emotionals. For parents about the so-called emo culture, read what is emo? Well, Barb, this is something that has come out of the internet and into music and the lives of Utah teens. News reports on emos were designed to terrify parents, focusing on the subculture's apparent obsession with self-harm and the very poorly aged concern about <clears throat> gender bending. Gender bending is also part of the emo culture. Boys wear girl pants and makeup. Girl pants! But like any teenage culture, emo was specifically designed to piss off parents. So its vilification in the mainstream media probably helped it with its target demographic. But emo's real downfall was orchestrated by the very forces that brought it to prominence. Emo culture may have popularized the selfie and the confessional blog, but it also brought another internet pastime to the fore, cyberbullying. Being an emo kid online in 2006 was like wearing a MAGA hat to your liberal arts lecture. You were kind of asking for it. For every extended fringe, there was a full body cringe and an army of trolls waiting to pounce. You might remember this emo hate anthem that did the rounds in 2006. I wear skin tight clothes while hating my life. If I said I like girls, I'd only be half right. But the single most egregious case of online emo phobia came in the form of National Emo Kid Beatdown Day cleverly scheduled for the 6th of June, 2006. Get it? You get it. From MySpace to 4chan, the happy hate crime holiday spread like septus from a septum piercing. And while there were no recorded emo pummelings on the day, anti-emo violence became a genuine global problem. It was officially declared a hate crime here in the UK, and there were actually roaming gangs of anti-emo vigilantes in Mexico City. This young emo is cornered and beaten. The young man survives, 
but his attackers run round looking for more emos. But if I were to retroactively point to the final digital nail when emos cyber coffin, it was this. Where it became a punchline for YouTube's favourite sexual predator. Sorry, I mean YouTube's favourite alleged sexual predator. When this guy's making fun of you, it might be time to return to your natural colour and force yourself to like jazz or something. Ah, jazz. The thinking man's migraine. As for the bands, well, like a toilet that won't flush, some of them just kept that shit up, with groups like Paramore maintaining a loyal fan base to this day. But the main exhibitors of the emo style made it their mission to distance themselves as far as possible from the label. They've been quoted, quoted as saying emo is a pile of shit. Oh shit, yes. Why is it? Citing 90s emo as the one true emo. Well, emo as it is today, which is nothing like emo as it was um, when I was growing up. And Panic at the Disco frontman Brendan. Brendan Uri? Oh, I don't know. Has made no secret of the fact that he just wants to close the goddamn door on the song that made his band so popular. The label became so toxic that it even sunk one of the era's most profitable film franchises, with Tobey Maguire's evil emo dance number in Spider-Man 3 being the only thing that anyone remembers from that cinematic stillbirth. So after applying a healthy dollop of public ridicule, the emo rash disappeared as quickly as it developed. It survived as an insult and a meme a lot longer than it actually lived in cultural relevance. And ironically, that's probably what kept its memory alive long enough to inspire genuine nostalgia. Just two years ago, Post Malone dropped Welcome to the Black Parade during a DJ set. And look at the crowd, they're loving it. And you know what, maybe it's just the hair dye going to my brain, but I like that song too. It's good. I mean, it's not really good, but like it's, it's an anthem. I mean, it's not Mozart or Ambient Nonsense 12 by Aphex Conjoined Twin, but it's good like Bohemian Rhapsody's good. It doesn't make sense, but it doesn't have to. Yes, it's theatrical, and you'd be embarrassed to be caught singing it on your own, but if you were in a room full of people screaming along, are you telling me you wouldn't join in? The... the screen's gone black, hasn't it? Is the Patreon label there? <laughs>